Welcome to Legacy Conversations, a channel where we preserve military memories and history. Hello Internet, I'm excited, you know, when I speak to our Rhodesians, I'm always excited, I'll tell you why, I mean, I'm sure you've heard me say this before, but when I came to my counterinsurgency training in, in, in the South African Police Force, we had a lot of Rhodesian instructors, instructors there, and they, they were tough, tough guys, and they were very experienced, they were so experienced, you know, and they would, they would not follow the manual, to be honest. They would teach us the way the police wanted us to teach, and then they would say to us, chaps, stand closer, form a circle. And we form a circle, and it says, I mean, very bad of recalls. I'm not even going to say this, but it, it came out like, okay, screw the generals. I'm telling you this is going to happen. Get rid of all your kit. Guys, you don't need all that kit. You need water. You need something to eat because you can poach along the way, and you need ammunition. Above all, that's what you need and radio contact. Guys, if you have that, you're fine. Don't overload yourself. You need to, to move quickly, quickly. And then, of course, you do 100 push-ups because he, he thinks that you're not fit enough or whatever. That was the other thing. That's something about fitness. And they really disliked our boots. They said, get some Felix. So anyway, I knew a lot about the Rhodesians by then because um, I grew up in King Williamstown. And a lot of the Rhodesians actually arrived there. They were working for the Transkai as well as for the Siskai. And one night, of course, the uh, Transkai Special Forces attacked the Siskai. And I was a very young constable just out of a police college. And we saw the tracer running across the, the road. And we declared neutrality, shoot four ways, four shots in that way, four, four shots in that way, and they start shooting at us. And I can tell you, you've never seen a Toyota Hilux Bucky go that fast in reverse in your life. <laughs> Then later, of course, we found out that South African intelligence was behind it. It's a long story, uh, but I can tell you I really like to speak to the Rhodesians. And here we have one uh, called Tony Bellinger. Now, you people probably know him. Fighting men of Rhodesia. Guys, fantastic show, that one. If you haven't watched it yet, please go and do so. You will learn things there, which, which is amazing. And I was speaking to Mac McCollum of the Rhodesia Regiment about a month ago and we were talking and talking and it's a very good show we put up with him as well a very good episode and i started talking about i said mac i heard that something happened somewhere in rhodesia these upro fellows uh, were trying to come across and invade rhodesia as has happened in history before i actually wrote a book about it not about this incident but about counter-terrorism in, in, in sub-saharan africa because i was utterly convinced that these people had the same instructors. Even if one was Chinese or North Korean or whatever, they were following the same same thing and they were learning from their mistakes and we were learning and it was evolving all the time. And so we had in 1972, around about there, you had North Vietnam coming south into South Vietnam. By the way, that is where that famous movie comes out, Bad 21. I don't know if you people remember that many years ago, this American Air Force officer shot down, they had to be rescued. He was rescued inside South Vietnam, strangely enough, not yeah. Vietnam. Yeah, oh yeah. And, and yeah, and so then came, I'm not sure what the date was, 79, 80, but I'm sure that um, Tony will tell us because he was actually there when these APRA fellows tried to, to attack Rhodesia conventionally. And, and, and it's really interesting, conventional versus unconventional, and we'll talk about that as well. Because we got the expert here, we're we going to drain his brain. And then with you know, guys, then came 1989 and came the nine days of war in our own bush war. Same story. Swapu came across the border, uh, not quite as conventional with um, tanks and things like that, but they came over and they decided to stay. They didn't break and run. And so Kufu take, we took them on. And later the Air Force got hold of them as well. We're going to make episodes on that too. But now, Tony, I'm so glad you are here, man. Thank you. Thank you. And Thanks. sorry about my long, horrible, uh, long uh, in introduction, but that's my easy. I want to know, how did, it, how did it happen? How did you become an officer in the Rhodesian Army? Be a man amongst me. <laughs> Chris, thank you very much for the invitation. I feel really humbled to be on board um, amongst all the men that have spoken. And uh, um, I was a mere 
uh, national servicemen. I wasn't a regular, but bullets kill national servicemen as equally as well as the regulars. And our training was very, very thorough. Um, basically, I, I was born in 1955 in Salisbury, Rhodesia, to an English father and an Afrikaans mother. My mother was Afrikaans, uh, but she was raised by an English-speaking Scotsman. So she never really uh, had her mother tongue all that strong anymore, which was Afrikaans. Uh, her bloodline was the Fissa clan. And since I've had a, a blood test done recently, a DNA test, I've discovered thousands and thousands of Afrikaans relatives, which is lovely. So I have an affinity for South Africa. I really respect the South African people. And um, I am impressed from many reports I've heard of the aggressiveness of the South African soldiers. And in fact, um, that, that came to light from a general in the Second World War. He said, give me four American divisions to invade, two to hold the ground, and one South African to finish the war. <laughs> so, you know, I have this I have this love for South Africa, and I'm very sorry to see what's happening there. But anyway, I was raised in a, a middle-class family, and um, in about 1973, I decided to go overseas. I traveled around the world for three years. I met this lovely American girl in Australia. I came back with her to Rhodesia. I told her what a lovely land it was, which it was at the time. And uh, she fell in love with the place, but the, the miserable bugger at uh, immigration in Salisbury Airport, he said, you didn't apply for a visa. I'm giving you two weeks to find a job and accommodation or else you must go. And so we started looking for work for her and living with my parents. Um, my mom was a dragon and she made my girlfriend's life a hard time. But um, we eventually found her a job and no sooner... Uh, the Department of Manpower in, in Rhodesia was very efficient. If you moved a job or you came in and out of the country, it was a law to notify them. And so they knew I was back from my travels and um, I got my call-up papers. And when I got my call-up papers, my heart sank and I showed them to my girlfriend and her jaw literally dropped. She said, you're going away for 18 months. I've just arrived here. I said, well, I have to. So she contacted her dad in America, who is a wealthy banker, and said, Dad, we're in this predicament. What can we do? So he said, well, I'll pay for tickets for you guys to come on over. I'll give you a Corvette Stingray, my, one of my favorite motor cars, and enough money to tour around America for three months and, and then see what happens after that. So on the, on the left hand, I had this call-up paper. On the right hand, I had an invitation to the States. And guess what I did? <laughs> I, I, I went and did my national service. And unfortunately, that led to the end of our relationship. Um, but surprisingly, she stayed in the country for 10 years. So I don't know why she broke up with me. Anyway, that's a story getting too long. Um, I ended up on a troop train one evening landed down in Bulawayo at uh, Heaney Junction on the way to Llewellyn Barracks. Llewellyn was like a clearing house for the Rhodesian Army, where various representatives from other units, um, not so much SAS because they only recruited from established units, but RLI reps would be there, engineers, armored cars, artillery. They would come and select the men that they wanted for their units. The rest of us just became foot sloggers in the infantry. Um, and about two days into that, um, we were taken into a big hall and we were uh, divided up according to those men who had certain qualifications, um, academic qualifications. Um, the minimum criteria for being uh, able to apply for an officer, I think was matric or the, the level below, which was O level. Um, that that allowed 150 of us to start on a three-day pre-selection course, which was both mental and physical. And it was a, a test to see whether you could think clearly. Whether you, I was asked to talk on a toilet roll for four minutes. <laughs> so, you know, how do you do that? And it's spontaneous. And then your practical stuff, you would have an electrified area with a box of ammunition in it. 
you'd have uh, four poles and the length of rope, and you had to get a guy over there, hook up the ammo on the rope, and then pull him out. Nobody ever succeeded, but the guys with the clipboards in the background, they were waiting to see who was thinking, who was issuing orders, who was giving directions. And from that, they, out of the 150 to 200, uh, it came down to 12 of us that went up. In fact, it was less because we met some other guys when at the School of Infantry. So we got on a train, went back to Guello, where the College of Knowledge is, the School of Infantry. And I did a, a very tough uh, four and a half month course. Um, it was based along the lines of getting to know your weapon, uh, patrolling the S's, uh, shape, shine, silhouette, blah, 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 rifle range. Uh, it was very, very thorough. The classroom work, the practical work was really, really good. And so much so that a national serviceman could join any unit uh, without losing his rank. He would have to go through a trial period of three to six months, and if he passed that, he would be accepted. So it was a very high level fitness-wise. Um, I'm amazed I passed it because I suffered very much from asthma as a kid, but I was very determined and just pushed through um, and eventually came out with one pip. It was um, a second lieutenant, and um, I was attached to four independent company, which was based up at Wanky in the northwest corner of the country in Operation Tangent. Um, my company commander was uh, a guy called Pierce, um, not Dumpy Pierce for those who know the Rhodesian Army. He was Martin Pierce um, from the um, RAR. There were three platoons in the company. And um, I thank God and kissed the, the earth when I was told I was I was going to be based up at Victoria Falls. <laughs> now, that's like going from hell, which Wanky is. It was a coal mining town in a valley. It was swelteringly hot. There was smoke from all the all the coal being burnt and stuff like that and extricated. And um, uh, five, com five platoon had to stay there. And one platoon, uh, three platoon went somewhere else. And four platoon being mine went to Vic Falls. And so... It was fantastic. I'll never forget the beautiful drive up there, the, the majestic trees, the smooth tar going northwest up to, to Wanky. And then I'd never seen Vic Falls before. And of course, it was a holiday resort. There were golf courses. There were girls in bikinis, which, you know, when you're a young national serviceman, is, uh, can tend to make you rather stiff at times. But... Um, we landed there and we were initially based behind the police station. And then we were given um, uh, quarters uh, just below the Elephant Hills Hotel, just to the west of the of the village um, in, at some old national parks, game ranges uh, properties. And we converted it, we painted the walls, we got the electric sorted out, planted some grass, and very soon had an established camp. Um, and from the very word go, the very first day we arrived there, uh, my company command, my company 2RC, Sean Van Strans, he made us go on patrol that first night, which I didn't enjoy doing. I'd only met my guys two hours before. Uh, we hadn't even split up into sticks yet. But the Rhodesian Army was very efficient in terms of giving out radios, uh, maps, uh, all that sort of stuff, areas of responsibility. And we were given an area to patrol and we had to uh, go at last light west of Vic Falls uh, and then ingress on this dirt road down into the valley. <clears throat> uh, part of Vic Falls was up on an escarpment, the, the village itself. There was about a 400, drop meter, 400 foot drop to the valley. And so when we went west and then north, we walked down this long slope. Uh, the village itself has got a bit of a cliff on it, which we'll come into a story later on. And there we started our patrols. Um, we would uh, get to an area, sleep overnight, and then I'd divide my 30-man platoon up into four or six sticks. And they would start patrolling 
designated areas with designated boundaries. I, of course, took the one that was closest to me, being an officer, I chose the shortest walk. But uh, <laughs> so we started cross grain patrols. We patrolled during the day. It was very sandy, full of game, full of ticks, my word, and the magnificent Zambezi River right there, beautiful place. And during the day when it was very hot, we'd lie up under a tree and look at the monkeys cavorting in the, in the canopy and watching sable and antelope, other beautiful buck go past, lion, uh, magnificent place. So we would cross grain during the day, and in the evening we would ambush. Um, and then we would slink away before first light and um, go and regroup, have our breakfast, and commence the day patrols, which lasted up until about 11 o'clock, because beyond that it was getting very, very hot up until the 40s. And then we'd commence again at about three and then ambush again that night. Uh, of course, that, that went on for months and nothing happened. There was no war when I got up there, but it very rapidly changed, uh, very, very rapidly. Um, and I'll just give you a few um, highlights of what happened before I talk about the invasion. Um, so it gives you a bit of a background picture. Um, from that point, I was transferred east of Vic Falls to a place called Jambezi Keep, about 45 kilometers east of Vic Falls, overlooking the very rugged, steep-sided um, uh, valley down to the river. But we were just south of the road that ran parallel with the river. North of the road, it was not really an area where the locals could live. It was too rough. But south of the road, the dirt road, um, there were a lot of local people living there. Um, and we were ensconced in this keep. Uh, it was um, a sand burned keep, about 60 meters by 60 meters, with a water tower and some uh, accommodation uh, buildings in it for us, these sort of asbestos lean to things. And so we started patrolling there and ambushing and and uh, it, it was thickly wooded. Uh, one of the horrors I still remember is walking through the, these beautiful teak forests at night and getting these big spiders in my face with that sort of yellow, the, the very strong yellow web that they had. <laughs> Horrible. Um, I used to make guys walk in front of me after my first two. But anyway, um, we did a lot of that ambushing, but nothing ever happened. So Lee scouts came in north of the road. They picked up a big arms cache with 12.7s and rocket launchers and that type of thing. Uh, they had far more sophisticated means of getting information than we did. But we, we were in and out of that keep. And then one night, the guys had worked hard. So I thought, I'll give them a bit of a, uh, a bit of free time. And a cow had stood on a mine and killed the one in front of it and behind it. So we suddenly had a load of meat and we had a, a, a chef that was on call up uh, in the keep. And we went out and, and uh, cut up this. It, it was useless trying to follow up the twos that laid the mine because these Majibos, little black guys, uh, would herd their cattle over the area and the, the prints would be gone, the, the footprints of the enemy. So we had all this meat, and the guy was preparing it, and I thought, so I'll, I'll go to this fishing camp down the road and buy some beer. And it was a stupid thing to do. It, was, it turned out to be 50 kilometers east of where we were, and I went in a single truck, which is uh, against all regulations in the army, but I wanted to get some beers for the guys. Anyway, on the way back, uh, as I hit the Mtetsi River, um, I saw this tracer in the distance, red and green tracer. The Rhodesian army fired red tracer and the Turks fired green tracer. I saw this sheet of tracer and I thought, oh, dear Lord, the camp's under attack. So I tried calling them, nothing happened. So I kept driving back closer and closer and closer until eventually I thought, if I go any closer, I'm, I'm going to get caught in a, uh, an ambush of some type. So I just pulled off the road, turned the lights off. It was dark, of course, this is night now. And um, man, it went on for an hour and a half, the thuds and the bangs. 
and the tracer everywhere. When it calmed down, I just drove with one wheel in the middle of the road and one off the road in case they put mines down and crept into the camp. And I shouted and blew the hoot out. Nobody would come and open the gate. Eventually, the skinny little guy came down from the bunker and he was white as a sheet. And I said, let me in here before I bloody court martial you, you know. And then he opened the gate, drove in. And I, you know, I said, bloody hell, that was unbelievable. So the next morning, um, we did a 360 to pick up tracks. We found um, firing positions of uh, 50 tours. Uh, and I also picked up 52 mortar fins. I think they fired a 61 millimeter mortar. We had a 60, they had a 61. The communists made their mortar tubes one millimeter bigger in diameter so that we couldn't use their rounds, but they could use ours. Anyway, 52. Um, only three landed inside the keep. And at the corner of the keep, each corner was a bunker. Now, the one round that did land was right at the bunker I would have gone into. So I often wonder, was it some type of divine thing that got me out of the camp that night? But um, I will take my hat off to the uh, the internal affairs guards that looked after that camp. They had khaki uh, clothes and a, like a, a red banded cap. And they only had 303 rifles, these African guys. And you know, they stood their ground, they lay on the edge of that berm and fired away with their 303s without any top cover. Uh, one had his hand quite badly mangled from a bit of shrapnel, but that was the only injury. And then helicopters came and armored cars to show a bit of strength. And um, so they they came, the, the, the wounded and one wounded guy in a compound was wounded, he was taken away. And um, that, that was the end of that scene, but it, it showed going from zero to massive numbers of tours being in the area, sneaking in over the border. The Russian mindset was that they always crossed in the same area, and that often made it easy for us to, to ambush the crossing points. Um, but after, after that scene, we did a very successful coordinate search just west of that in the, the uh, Kavira forest, the teak forest, where there was quite a large um, African labor force of about a thousand people. We did a very successful coordinate search there and um, the police that came in to search while we cordoned it off, um, they, got, they got a couple of terrorists out of that. So it was very slow and grinding for us. It wasn't... Um, like on the eastern side of the country where guys were saying, I had a pile of bodies 60, 60 deep around my machine gun. It was nothing like that. Um, it was a grind. But anyway, I got back to, uh, while we were out there, we heard over the radio that one of the, the, the motels in town had been attacked. And um, I'd established friends with a girl by that point, and I was a bit worried she'd been injured, but uh, apparently, Peter's Motel, the first motel going into the village, had been attacked while we were gone. And it, it, Vic Falls was was like a virgin lying there in the bush waiting to be raped. There was no fence around it. We had we had nothing to protect that village. It it was bush all the way to the Indian Ocean on the west and all the way to the Atlantic Ocean, or well, Indian on the right and Atlantic on the left. There was nothing. We were 120 k's from Wanky, and that was 280 k's from Bulawayo. So we were this village in the little middle of nowhere, and attacks were taken very seriously. Uh, the tours could literally just walk into that village and do what they liked. And so when it was attacked, it was serious. And um, so uh, we got back to the base camp at Vic Falls, and uh, we were resting and re-equipping, ready to go out again. We normally had two weeks or three weeks out and uh, two days in a camp, uh, refreshing and having a swim and going to the casinos. And then we were out again on another two-week cycle. Um, I was uh, resting one sort of morning, having a bit of a, a lie-in, and my 
company commander or the TRC, Sean von Strantz, came in and said, Tony, I want you to go up to the police station and meet Special Branch because they've managed to capture the guy that had attacked Peter's Motel. So I got in a vehicle and went up there to meet Special Branch and uh, a few other people holding this, this terrorist. He got out the back of a little police van and I remember we'd been chasing his footprint for months. We could never catch him. Big footprint, size 12. And he got out of the back of this van. He was about six foot four. Um, really big, moppy hairstyle, little beard. And his eyes were sort of stained, bloody, browny, red color, almost yellow. It sounds very Hollywood, but they were like that. When I looked at him, I actually got a shiver down the spine because... As I learned later, he, he killed uh, Mr. Cummings. Uh, he killed the people that raised him at a mission in Bulawayo. He put a branch across the, the road at their gate. When they got out of their car to, to move the branch, he stepped into their headlights and they said, oh, Albert, how are you? You know, and he shot them dead. You know, that's his thanks for being raised by missionaries. And he robbed stores, and he was a nasty bugger. He killed about five or six people. Anyway, he was standing there, and we had to go through the attack so that a docket could be put together by the police to charge him for murder of this man that had died from his RPG-7 that he fired at, at the reception area. And so we were going through this. We found um, a rocket lying on the floor, uh, some empty and full magazines left there and then that was over and done um and uh i went went back to uh i don't know why i actually had to go there because it was a police investigation but i went back to the camp and uh had a swim and then the next morning i was rudely shaken awake at about six o'clock in the morning and um i was told uh this guy's escaped from the jail. And um, I did a lot of research into this after the war. And I don't know if he'd been turned by the silly scouts and he'd now become an asset. Because if you didn't join the scouts, they they is executed you straight away normally. At least I think that's correct. I don't want to say things that get me into trouble. But you know, that that was sort of the plan. A very severe threat. But he'd escaped from jail. I don't know how he did it. So automatically there, there was this massive um, upgrade of troop numbers. Aircraft came in, helicopters came in, police with dogs. Uh, I was put onto a, a 2.5, which is a Unimog, I think made in South Africa with a German engine in it. Two and a half tonner, very well mind-proofed, as I will tell you in a later story. And... Um, we set off west along the tar road that joins Victoria Falls with Kazangula, way over to the west. That uh, Kazangula is is where Namibia, South Southwest Africa at the time, um, uh, Botswana and Rhodesia all came to that corner. And so, either side of the road had been made very deliberate, wide, sandy pieces, and it, it was customary for trackers on vehicles to drive down that road every morning to see if footprints had been crossing and then, you know, we could follow them up. So I had seven guys, myself making eight, two sticks, two radios, and I've estimated how far he might have gone uh, running in a very sandy area off to the right. And um, I thought, well, this will be a good point to drop off my first four guys. And they walked along trying to pick up spore. I went uh, three kilometers down the road and dropped the other four off. And then I would just go backwards and forwards all day, trying to keep at the pace of a man running from authority. Uh, and, you know, when you're scared, you can go quite fast. So we moved quite quickly. Um, as it turned out, many years later, after doing research into all this, somebody had actually met him in the village, put him in a car or a truck or something and hidden him at the police checkpoint going west and he eventually got to um, the Botswana ferry that went over to Zambia and he escaped. So that's why we think 
there was something very fishy there. But anyway, this episode leads to a very interesting story now. My first uh, conflict with the Zambian army. And so we kept going west, kept going west. The rain was unbelievable. And we thought, well, we can't track anybody anyway. I've never seen thunderstorms like that. In fact, one of my other call signs, this sergeant just disappeared. He got lost for days in this torrential rain. So we got to Kazangula, and there at Kazangula is a brilliant police camp. Beautiful. What a place to be stationed at African and European quarters. It was fenced off. It had rolling grass down to the beautiful Blue Zambezi River. It had this boat bobbing in the water. What a beautiful place to be based. The fishing there was unbelievable. Anyway, we arrived there late in the evening as really cold, wet, bedraggled soldiers. And the, the man, man in charge of the police camp, his name was Ian Kemp. He was as wild as you get them. Uh, he'd gone bush living out there. And he, he gave us a, a bedroom and I got my own room. These beautiful white sheets. I had a hot shower. We had a meal. We had beers. It was unbelievable. I woke up the next morning with the most amazing cup of coffee and a breakfast. Shortly after the breakfast, I got a, a telephone call from Sean Van Strantz. Uh, well, actually, it was Major Pierce by that point. He was back at Big Falls. He said, hang on there, Tony. I'm coming out with some armored cars and some uh, uh, mortar and some other stuff. And um, we're not going to look for Albert anymore. I want you to do um, a border patrol in vehicles from Vic Falls down, to, sorry, from Kazangula south southeast down to Panda Matenga, which was about 100 k's. So it was a job to show the flag. And I thought, wonderful, I'm on a vehicle, I don't have to walk. And um, anyway, at about 11 in the morning, we were cleaning our rifles out on the grass there. In came the 4th Armoured Infantry or Mechanized Brigade of one ferret scout car, which was made in the 1950s, a tired old four five, four and a half tonner uh, truck, excellent trucks, mineproof very well, as I'll tell you later. I went up in all types of trucks and landmines. But anyway, behind that was an Eland armored car from South Africa. The South Africans had loaned us 60 Eland armored cars. Uh, for your foreign viewers or listeners, that's a Panhard, the old Panhard 90 design. And this thing coughed and farted its way into the camp. And I met the major. And he said, listen, I want your vehicle. He probably, my vehicle was a 2.5, which was very sporty and could climb up hills and go underwater. He probably had some woman he wanted to take out and impress. So he took my vehicle and I put my guys on this old clapped, clapped out four, four and a half tonner with a box of ammo and a mortar tube. And um, he said, right, just show the flag, you know, look for crossings from the Botswana side. It was literally a four-strand fence. It wasn't a, a fence at all. Four-strand fence. That's all that separated us from Botswana. Anyway, we were about to start that. He took off with, with his prize vehicle, which I was annoyed about. But um, I, I said to the guys, why don't we have a look at the bunker on the Zambezi River and start our patrol from there? Now, this road that we were on at the customs post right there at the Botswana border, it went north up to a bunker, and then it went south to Panamatenga. And we waved at the Botswana troops. They all had their helmets on. Anyway, we went north up to this um, bunker. It was only about 800 meters north of the customs post. A lot of swamp either side of the road with Ligavons trying to slide out of the way of our vehicle. And, and our big Rhodesian armored fighting mechanized column of a ferret and an armored car one truck arrived at the at the bunker and we ensconced ourselves in there. I went inside. It, it was a very well uh, built bunker. It had very good top cover, very good side cover with concrete um, having been kept in place by corrugated iron and a beautiful view across the very swollen, fast running Zambezi River, which was 400 meters wide at that point. Just to my left, is where the ferry from Botswana went over into Zambia. 
that's where all the trade was going on these big ferries. And directly in front of us on the other side of the river was the Zambian customs post, a singular building on its own. To the right or the east was um, a big tree and behind it a water tank and a building that we couldn't quite see through the trees there, which will play into my story just now. But I, I got inside the bunker and the guys followed me in. The armored car parked behind the bunker, the truck parked behind the bunker. The ferret parked under a big tree just downstream from where we were under a big tree, a big thorn tree. And um, he ensconced himself there about 30 meters away. I got my binoculars out and I quickly established that there was a big bunker on the other side directly opposite us. I could see the, the Zambians with their binos and and then there was uh, just to the east of that was a slip trench with more troops in and I saw a couple of guys stick their heads around at the immigration post on the other side. And then some of them climbed up on the roof of their bunker and put their helmets on. And Zambia being an ex-English colony, they could speak English pretty well. And then it, it was cool, so the air carried, the sound carried well on the dense air over 400 meters. And they started swearing about Ian Smith and that we were racists and now, I liked Ian Smith. He was a friend of the family, and um, I didn't take kindly to that, so we got up on the bunker of our, our, our bunker's roof, and we started telling them what we thought of Kawinda. And, you know, it was just basic fun, but they jumped down. They had no sooner got on the ground on their side, and, of course, all hell let, let rip at us. I've never got off a roof of anything so quickly. Dived into the bunker, and there were RPG-7s. There was a 12.5, 12.7, or a 14.5. There were mortars. There were dozens of, or at least 15 AKs on automatic firing at us. And I've never seen stuff flying around like that. It just, so I shout to the guys. We were all down in the bunker. I said, set your sights at 400, fire it, fire it will. You know, concentrate on the bunker initially. So we started returning fire, having a wonderful time there, potting at heads in the bunker. Um, I'd got my marksmanship badge in the army, so I think I was denting a few heads on the other side. It was great, and it went on and on and on and on. But then it got nasty. When that 12.7... He was cutting the grass, and the, the armored car guys were nervous because an Eland can take on a 12.7 from the front, but it can't on the side armor. Um, so they were worried about being turned into Swiss cheese. Anyway, um, we got hold of the jock in Wanky through the radio of the armored car. They had a very good radio, and they gave us rare permission to fire across into Zambia to defend ourselves. So we were in the bunker. I told the guys to put their hands over their ears because you're right next to the muzzle brake of, of this big 90 mil gun, which were bigger than guns in the Second World War tanks. You know that. And um, so this thing crept out from behind the bunker and it, you could hear a slight pause in the firing from the other side when they saw this armored car. And then he fired a, a bunker uh, uh, at the bunker, but the first round was too high. And it went over and landed behind the bunker. But I knew, having climbed up a little communication tower before we started our argument, that on the other side were vehicles, the army camp. And it might have hit a vehicle. Anyway, he, he uh, compensated and he fired uh, two or three rounds into the bunker. And there was all this boiling smoke and dust coming out. And then he put a couple of rounds into the the slip trench and then swung the gun right and where the big tree was where they were firing the 12.7 he put it two three rounds in there there was a secondary explosion which means he hit something um and then the mortar was also there as well we could hear it donking from there it all went very quiet and by that stage it was lunchtime and we just sat for the rest of the afternoon staring across the river and then I thought you know, if we get out of here, we're exposing our backs to them. Um, I'm going to wait until last light, and then we'll move out. 
And so by late afternoon, something triggered them again, and it started all over again. But this time, I had the mortar tube off our truck. I hadn't been able to use it in the first instance. I'd put it into a, a little pit that had obviously been dug there before, either by the South Africans or Rhodesians. But um, I, there were about 30 rounds in a case of ammo. And so I put one and a half cases of <laughs> shells into their side. It was a little two-inch thing with a flat head. You pulled a trigger. But it, it was a delightful little weapon. You know, I put charge one on, and it was short, so I put charge two on. And I soon had it zeroed in and was doing nice damage. Uh, the 12.7 had opened up again. And so I put quite a lot of rounds down there. And there was another bang and a big sh flame shot up. And all of a sudden, and I've got photographs of this, which I'll be sending you to have a look at. Um, one of our guys was taking photographs illegally, illegally during this. But... Um, all of a sudden, the big fire, the grass is quite long that type of time of year, was sweeping west. And by last light, the whole Zambian bank was one swirling inferno, and it went right through the army trucks, and it was wonderful. Anyway, I thought I told the guys to get out of there and the armored car to get out of there. I said, I'll drive the truck out. Um, the way it was positioned, I would have had to reverse so that the bum faced the Zambian side. And when I put my foot on the brake, the lights would light up and I'd become a target. And I had a brainwave. I thought, man, those uh, ammo boxes are the same size as the light, the, the cardboard ammo boxes are the same size as the, the, the brake light. So I put boxes over the brake lights, reversed towards the, the river and shot out the camp and nothing happened. Now, to quickly end off the story, I went back to the police camp. We were all in high spirits. Uh, the camp was well protected, so I said to the guys, let your hair down, have drinks. I said, you can get plastered if you like, I don't care. We're not going anywhere tonight. And then while I was talking to camp, the, the place started to vibrate to the west like you couldn't believe. So we ran out of the bar to this communication tower which was about 50 feet high, and we climbed up it. He went up first. I'm very scared of heights, so I tenderly followed up behind him. And there to the west was massive rocket trails and big uh, dark orange ready flashes, and they were hitting the, the bunker. Knowing they're shooting, they were probably landing on the Botswana army's heads, which was... Uh, so old, old Ian, he said, you know, they can't do this, man, the bastards. He said, come, let's go and have some fun on the boat. Uh, we'd, we'd had a few drinks by that point. Yes, people listening to this might think I was irresponsible, but I was a young national serviceman, 21. And so we grabbed a machine gun and a couple of rifles and jumped on his boat, which was a jet propulsion boat. And we skimmed west towards uh, where the firing was on the, on the bank over there and came across the army camp. He said, that building there, the one I told you through the trees, was the army camp. And he said, they've just installed these big plate glass windows in the officer's mess. So we snuck up there, and we emptied a belt into the windows and just had fun shooting up the building. Uh, and then we went back to camp and got thoroughly pissed. So... From Kazangula, I was transferred to, um, no, I wasn't transferred. I, I must tell you something that happened before I was transferred. I went back to the cross-graining patrols on, on the riverbank. And the one time we were patrolling, and it was late afternoon, early evening, we went down to the river to get water, and we had these little pills we'd put in the water to make it safe to drink. Uh, and we'd gone down there, and... Man alive, we were shot at quite heavily from the other side. The river was about 300 meters wide there, just near some rapids. And all this green tracer was coming over and stuff, and RPG-7s. And I, th I thought, you bastards, you know, so we engaged them. And then it got, it got really heavy. And then I, 
I noticed in the sky, it was dark, almost dark by that point. Um, actually, it was lovely hearing our machine gun return the fire. That MAG 760 is a lovely weapon, isn't it? Um, up in the sky, about 3,000 feet up, this orange glint caught my eye. Now, it was still sunlight up there, but dark where we were. And I got my binos out, and this is all while the firing was going on, and I looked up at this thing, and it was a military aircraft. It was a training aircraft. Um, it's what the South, exactly the same aircraft as the South Africans used as the Impala jet aircraft. But it was silver, and it had orange tips on it because it was a training plane. But when it turned through my binos, I could see rockets under the wings. And I thought, man, alive, it's just there by coincidence. Things were getting hairy, and I was ready to tell the guys to uh, crawl on their bellies through this uh, gully and get out of there. When this thing turned towards us, of course, I'm telling you, it was doing a run-in for a strike. Now, I, I pity any person who has faced an airstrike. At that point, if you'd stuck a, a pen in my pupil, you couldn't have pulled it out because it was biting. And this thing kept coming and coming and coming. It was in attack formation. And I just shot the guys, get in that gully, get down. But about four or five hundred meters from the Zambi River, it turned west and left. And the sun glinted off it. And there were all the rockets. And they, they were basically saying, you know, get out of there. I noticed a hut on the other side of the river, an old derelict African hut. And I thought if I put some traces into that, the wind was blowing in the right direction to go across where these people were shooting at us from. And I set the hut on fire and this roiling, curling smoke, just beautiful cover. And we slid out from there and went back to camp. Um, so that's another little incident that happened. Um, I'm, I'm slowly working my way towards the, the invasion of Rhodesia. So just these are a few interesting things that happened. At that point, I was transferred from four in depth to one in depth, which was based on the shores of Kariba Dam up at Binga. You might want to insert a map uh, drawing of this from your own records, but went to Binga. Um, the Mavuradonna and Matusadonna mountains were there and uh, I can tell you, you could have lost an army in there and you wouldn't have found them. It was an area I didn't want to go to because I've now got my girlfriend at Vic Falls. I was, I was a lounge lizard. I liked the hotels and all that sort of stuff. And I knew the commanding officer of one dip, one in dip was a tough guy. <laughs> I didn't fancy going for road runs with him and that type of thing. So I went there with great reluctance. And um, actually, when I got there, we were put on standby because the Zambian army or Turs had got onto this island called Chetty. And the civilian ferry coming from Kariba to, to Bingabumi Hills, wherever it landed, was getting shot at by these Turs on the island. And so we were putting together, or the major was putting together an invasion force to go over by boats or helicopters and to sweep the island and take the tears out. Uh, but it never happened. It, it was cancelled. And no sooner ha had he said, oh, it's, it's cancelled, Tony, he said, you've got 10 days R&R. &R. And I went, yeah, back to Vic Falls, back to my wife, back to swimming pools, Green Valley wine. So off I go. And um, the first night I got back there, I was absolutely exhausted mentally, psychologically, physically, just, you know. My girlfriend was a creepier in the casino, and she said, I'm going off to work now. That was about 8 o'clock at night. I stayed in our double bed uh, listening to, do you remember Jeremy Walmart? Not Jeremy Walmart. Oh, was it Jerry Walmart from, from LM Radio? Then he moved to 702 or Jacaranda Radio or something. I was listening to Spin Out or Spin Along or something like that at 10 o'clock at night, just daydreaming, looking out the window. The curtains were open. It was dark, semi mooned at night. And then there was this big flash on, on the window, it lit it up. Uh, 
But I wasn't alarmed because we had a tremendous amount of electric storm, thunderstorms there, a lot of thunder and lightning. But then there's a subtle difference between an explosion and a lightning bang. The main thing is you can feel the vibration through the floor from a bang, a, a ground orientated bang. And I felt the <laughs> through the ground, you know. And the next thing, there were sheets of green tracer flying past the window. And, and I, you, you know, your blood pressure goes up, your adrenaline kicks in. Uh, I ran out and turned the passage light on so it wasn't too brightly lit in my room. And when Rhodesian soldiers went on R&R, &R, they had to take their rifle with them with one magazine or their whole mag ammo load. And I... I had my kit there. I very quickly got dressed. Now, the standing order at Vic Falls is that any man who knew how to handle a weapon had to go to the police station, okay? And then the superintendent would allocate you various places of defense, which was normally the hotels. So my next-door neighbor came out, and he was looking northwest at all the flashes and bangs, and he said, come on, I'll give you a lift down to the police station. We went there and met about 15 to 20 men, and some were long-haired hunters, others were soldiers on leave like me. We all had our weapons, and the superintendent allocated various numbers of them to go to the hotels to protect them. And then I said, then he said, right, I need a volunteer to go on a boat on the river because the Elephant Hills has been attacked, the chances are, the enemy came across on a boat and I want you to go and intercept it going back. So I put my hand up and uh, Fricky, my next door neighbor, put his hand up. Yeah, he, he only had a pistol, by the way. And then we were introduced to this redhead uh, cop called Phil and he was going to be the boat driver. Uh, there were four of us all together. I only had one magazine. Eh? I'm going to war in one magazine now. Uh, I don't know why I went with one magazine, but anyway. Then we get a, a browning, uh, you know, the one with the holes in the barrel and a uh, beautiful gun with two boxes of ammo. And I said, right, let's get on the transport, you know. So we walked around the corner and I was expecting a Unimog or an armored personnel carrier. There was this little Renault R4 police car, you know, the type with the gearbox and the dashboard. I said, you've got to be joking. We're going to be driving down the road that the tours are actually using to fire at Elephant Hills in a pop-up toaster. I said, you've got to be crazy. Anyway, uh, they said, well, don't come then. And they were ready to go. And I thought, oh, well, I'll go. Now, bear in mind, I was on leave. You know, at one in the morning, my wife was, my girlfriend was going to come home and give me some bitty, bitty bang boom. And here I am in a pop-up toaster heading down to the police jetty to get on a boat to go and fight, uh, fight tears. Anyway, we got down to the, the boat. We ensconced the, the gun in this pole on the port side of the boat, put the ammo in position, fed it into the chamber. I'd never fired one before, but I've, they rigged it up and said, right, all you do is press that button thing and fire. So I thought, oh, that's okay. And then we zoomed off upstream past the Azambezi Hotel, past the launch pad for the tourist boats. And there was a big island right in front of us called Long Island, if you look on a map. And I said, you know, it's Phil, it's possible they came in around, it's behind us. Go around the island and go and look there first before we go upstream. So we went down the northern side, heading east or south, because the river's going south at that point, looking to see if any were trying to cross back into Zambia at that point. It was a stupid thing to do because the river was running at a hell of a pace. You couldn't have kept up with it if, if you were a sprinter running on the shore. It was fast. And what we didn't realize, the jet engine, the jet suck in, push out, pull, pull, had sucked in a whole lot of weed. And now he was gunning it and we were going nowhere. We were literally, of course, caught in the river heading for the boiling pot at Victoria Falls. We were only about two and a half to three k's above uh, where Rhodes' statue is. And if we hadn't got that engine going, we would literally fall into our deaths. 
over that gone over. Um, but what we did is I got my rifle and Phil had a rifle and we had one oar on the boat and we used the butt of the rifles and we rowed over to this clump of just a bit of rock with a tree hanging over and some reeds. And we grabbed onto the reeds and they cut our hands and we had to grab onto another lot until we slowed down. Then we tied a rope around it. And then Phil did the most amazing thing. He stripped himself down to a pair of underpants, came out with this big jambui knife, jumped over the back and went underwater at night with crocs everywhere, digging all this weed out of the, the, the jet expulsion section got back on the boat, removed the engine cover, and with a torch, he cut off all the stuff internally, put it all back together again. And now, we couldn't start it where we were because we would have sucked more reed into it. So we ha just had to take the chance to push back in the river again. And um, it was life or death. If the boat didn't work, we would have died. I mean, this sincerely, this is not uh, Hollywood. We went out into the river, and he fired the engine, no problem with the engine running, it was the propulsion system. And he gunned it, and oh, my heart dropped, because I tell you, I was so scared at that point, because the boat only just kept up in the opposite direction, but we were slowly losing the battle. So I said, go right, get back to another island. But at that point, it cleared, and we took off so quickly that I fell over into the back of the boat, and we shot upstream like a bullet. So we went up past the side of the island where we'd started, past the Azambezi Hotel, beautiful hotel. It had the biggest thatch roof, roof in, in the world at that point. And after that, sort of the, the river was going west, and then it went north. At that point, which will come into the invasion story just now, the river narrowed. <clears throat> And it was a, a half moonlit night. Uh, the, the river looked like glass. It was smooth as we were zooming up. I said, slow down. We can't see anything at the speed. So we slowed down. <clears throat> and then I started to notice all these blobs in the water. And I thought, gee, the fish are really jumping tonight. But then I noticed that the fish jumping were attached to Green Tracer. <clears throat> and we were being shot at from the Zambian side. Um, hold on. And um, need a bit of sugar there to keep my blood sugar. We were, there were, there was tracer everywhere, everywhere coming past us. And um, I said to Phil, <clears throat> I can't bring my gun to bear because it's on the left hand side of the boat. I said, just do a U-turn. <clears throat> he did a U-turn. And I, I put the entire box uh, into the Zambian side. It was red tracer, so I knew I could get it at the right level. <clears throat> but it didn't diminish the tracer from the enemy. And so we were now driving back into a wall of tracer. I said, do a U-turn and go upstream again, which he did. And we went up and we ensconce ourselves on Kandahar Island. I don't know if you want to find a map of this to show the, the viewers. It used to be a place where the tourists used to go during the good days and have cups of tea and look at the monkeys stealing their sandwiches. And Anyway, we ensconce ourselves there. <clears throat> I climbed up into this low-hanging tree, as one other guy did, and we went onto the land. <clears throat> and we could hear the Zambians quite clearly. There were brake lights on trucks coming on, blah, blah, blah. Could hear men's voices. So we knew that we couldn't go back to camp that way. <clears throat> so we radioed camp and the, the boss man said, well, look, uh, we don't want to leave you guys out there. You're low on ammo. We'll send a relief column, column to come and get you. So we went back to the Rhodesian side to Hippo Creek which played a significant role in the talk of the invasion. <clears throat> we tied up the boat. There was this very big bush sort of sloping into the water. Its leaves were actually hanging in the water. We tied up on this side of it. What we didn't know 
is that the terrorists that had been attacking Elephant Hills had their dinghies on the other side of the tree. <clears throat> so we didn't have radios that we could carry, so we took the radio with us from the boat. But the aerial was fixed to the boat, so we had a radio with no aerial. Now, I knew from previous experience that, that type of radio could transmit maybe 500 meters without an aerial. So we walked south, sort of west, to a dirt road that ran parallel with the St. B.C. River, and we could hear this column of vehicles coming out to collect us. Why they did that, I don't know, because the weapons that had been fired at the Elephant Hotels was a B-10 recoilless rifle. It had AKs, it had all sorts of stuff. And they could have gone straight into an ambush with that recoilless rifle and been a heavy loss of life. I think the major who ordered that column to come out was just bloody stupid. But anyway, no sooner than I heard the column coming in, there was this massive flash, red-orange flash, and the ferret at the lead of the, of the column went up in a puff of smoke. Suddenly, the tours behind us, with the, we were about 100 meters away from them now, or 80 meters, the, the tours that had been shooting at the Elephant Hills opened up on the relief column, and we were in the middle. So the relief column was over there, the tours were over there, we were in the middle. And so all this tracer was coming over, all this green stuff. And I thought, you bastards. Um, I hadn't actually fired my rifle. Nobody else had fired. I'd given it to one to the to Fricky. I got it back from Fricky. And I thought, right, um, tracer starts about 40 to 50 meters from a rifle when it's fired. I offset 50 meters, 40 meters. And I just emptied the whole magazine on single rounds over there. And I could hear them cursing and shouting and screaming and running through the grass to get away. Um, and then we legged it up to the, the road. It, it brightly mid moon at this point. White sandy road, thick. And you know, bush at night is darn scary when you're in action because every bush looks like a soldier and you're shitting yourself all the time. And I got to the, the dirt road. Hello, talking to them on this radio. I, I made contact with the, the convoy commander and I said, we're coming in from the northeast on the road. Don't shoot us. Eventually got back to the, the column and I knew the guy who was the column leader from school. He was an SAS guy. <clears throat> there were three vehicles in the column. There was a, a ferret in the front, a 2.5 with about eight troops on it and and another one at the back. And um, uh, he said to me, go to the back vehicle, turn it around, and you can lead us out of here, okay, because I would then be in front. The, in the two injured guys from the armored car were put on our vehicle. Um, they left-hand drive vehicle, so he was ensconced in the passenger seat on the right and put the seat belt on him. His head was all bandaged up. It had blood on it. We had no sooner turned and gone five meters, of course, <clears throat> and that right front wheel hit a mine. <clears throat> Excuse me. I don't know how all those wheels going in missed the mine, but we hit it. Whack! In my left ear. Out of my left eye, this flash, and him taking off like a, a, a cork out of a champagne bottle. His seatbelt hadn't been put in properly. So he landed in a thorn bush about eight meters away. Um, and the, the drill is in the Rhodesian Army, if you hit a mine, you open fire on the immediate area and you debus off the back so that you're not jumping onto um, uh, uh, anti-personnel mines. So we all jumped off the back, ran back a few meters, went to ground, cleared the bush with fire. <clears throat> and then we hear from those guys in Zambia, they'd seen the flash from the landmine. We hear, and then, man, they were accurate. The mortars started landing all the way around us. They were everywhere. And we decided uh, Cardus was the better part of Valley, Valley. And we, we ran into the bush at, at full tilt. Two guys carrying the injured guys each. 
And I remember running into a Vach and Biki bush. They, they were these thorn bushes that would stop you dead with their thorns. I ran straight into one. And I still got a scar on my arm to this day where I had to rip myself out of the bush. So we're hearing the primary charge, counting 20 seconds, going to ground. And that, that went on for about 30 rounds. We then, um, the guy from the SAS and myself, now my hearing in my head was funny. I discovered later I'd lost my eardrum. But we said to the other guys, you all stay here. And um, here, the other guy and myself, we ran back to the village and we phoned the, the police camp and the army camp. And they sent out another column to go and rescue those guys. And um, that that basically uh, put the end of my um, my time with four independent company. Um, <clears throat> I was now downgraded to um, a lounge lizard sitting in an office doing pay and rations for the rest of my national service. Now I must move on a bit. My national service um, started to come to an end very quickly about October 77. I didn't know what I was going to do. I had no job anywhere. I had nothing to go back to in Salisbury where my parents were. And I was sitting with my <clears throat> girlfriend saying, what the heck am I going to do now? And she spoke to the casino boss, uh, Fred, lovely guy, looked like a big fat Mexican with his hair and moustache. Fred, delightful guy. He offered me a job at the casino. So I was now a trainee croupier. It was fantastic. I had a dicky boat tie, looked like James Bond. I was a bit easy on the eye, had lots of eye call from girls. It was great. Learning how to be a croupier. I'll tell you three very interesting incidents that happened to the civilians while I was a croupier there. The first one was um, my girlfriend liked pets. She wanted a cat. And so Ivor Ring said, I've just had a litter of kittens. Well, not me, his cat had. He said, come tomorrow morning and bring a box and come and pick up a kitten. So the next morning we went to his house. Now that part of the village overlooking the valley, it's very steep there. It's about a 400 foot drop down to the level of Elephant Hills Hotel below us. And so I parked outside the gate. My girlfriend went through the gate to, to go and get the cat. And um, the next thing, there was a loud bang. And she came running back to me. And she said, Tony, 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 come and look at this. I went inside. And then there was Ivor, his wife, the two domestic workers, Marilyn, and then myself, standing on the lip of this fall, this cliff, where his house was. Lovely house, beautiful house, manicured lawns, palm trees. And there I am looking down at this multi-million dollar Elephant Hills Hotel burning down right in front of my eyes. The smoke swirling out of it, this yellow, ugly, oily flames and smoke. And it was a beautiful hotel. I mean, you know, designed by Gary Player, the golf course there. Um, it had pigskin chairs, it had a casino, swimming pools, bars, an amazing place. And there it was burning down right in front of my eyes. Um, and um, the Portico had vehicles under it and people rushed out to get their vehicles out. And the sad thing is that they tested the fire system the day before, but the manager forgot to put the keys back where they belonged. And so nobody could turn on the hydrants. The, the closest uh, fire equipment was at the airport, 20 miles, 20 k's away. So they got there when it was just a shell. The army came, the police came. I could watch all this happening. And the people pouring out of the hotel. 20 minutes, it, it, it was charcoal. And I've got photographs I'll send you of the actual event. Um, the Rhodesian people, like the South Africans, are a little bit crazy. The next day, the lower bar was open. They'd cleaned up the swimming pool and they were back in there playing squash. And that, that was a very interesting uh, bit of information. And um, the other thing was, before I leave this whole section altogether, I think our talk will be about another 25 minutes, if that's okay. 
uh, December 1977, I was in the casino. We had loads of foreign tourists there, which the little village desperately needed, especially our hotel, which was becoming very threadbare. I hope our waiters didn't even have new uniforms. And it, it, it was substandard because we had no tourists from the war. But anyway, there were French women there. There were Germans. There were South Africans. There was the whole casino full. And I said to Fred, the, the manager, and my girlfriend was next to me, one of the croupiers, um, I said, I bet you 10 bucks that we get mortared tonight. Nah, they won't do that. He said, those guys will be getting pissed on the other side and, you know, they're not interested in war. Uh, ten ten dollars was a lot of money back then. I uh, asked ten bucks. Okay, I'll take you on. He said. Anyway, at about five minutes to midnight, as I said to you before, you can feel an explosion in your feet before you hear it. That's why elephants transmit very low rumbles. You hear the low sounds, and I felt, and then. And there was a lot of noise in the casino. There was pipe music, people shouting, ordering drinks. And I said to Fred, did you feel that? And he was sitting on the inspector's chair. I said, I said, put your feet on the ground, man. And then he felt a vibration and he said, oh, shit, you're right. And then before we knew it, bang, boom, bang, flashes of light. And the tourists, what the hell is going on? Is this part of the entertainment? You know, and these flashes through the windows, and then they realize this is war. And the panic, the squealing from the woman, and the dropping of chips being upturned and people scrambling. Fred ran to the door and he said, everybody follow me, follow me. And so about 100, 150 of us all followed him downstairs across this landing with a swimming pool on the right with all the pool lit, gaily lit and all that along this uh, concrete corridor with a breeze block wall, on the other side of which there were these big flashes of light, bang, bang. And um, we went down into, the, uh, down into the, the bottom part of the hotel, the basement, which was a floor down. Everybody squashed in there, and we could see the flashes through the little slit windows up at ground level. There was a lot of jittering, a couple of people crying. <clears throat> I said to Fred, I don't want to get killed down here like those people were in the Congo in the 60s. They were all massacred in the basement. I'm going upstairs. I'm going to find a weapon. I went upstairs, <clears throat> and there was an armored car guy there. I think he had an Uzi. And there was a South African guy there with this beautiful big rotary shotgun. I've never seen anything like it. And he was saying, come on, you black some bastards, you come out, I'll sort you out, you know. So I thought, oh, this is okay. And I went back downstairs. Um, about 45 minutes later, the shelling had stopped and uh, everybody came out. The human race is amazing. Fred said, free Tata whiskey for everybody. Had their free Tata whiskey. And within an hour, you would never have believed that that had happened. Everyone was back to you. Back to normal, music playing, people getting pissed, the human race. I said, Fred, it's going to happen New Year's Eve, a week from now. <clears throat> he said, this time I'm not betting. And sure it nuts. Next week at midnight, we were about to sing Old Land Zion. We had all the party hats on and the bastards did it again. And uh, it was a really heavy rev. Now that, I don't know why, but my girlfriend was off that night. She was at the hotel next door. So I was really worried about her, <clears throat> and I managed to cut a long story short. I managed to get hold of a Land Rover and scoot over to the other hotel, and all the people at that hotel, the the posh hotel, I forget the name of it, Victoria Falls Hotel, they were all in the the wings that go out to the bedrooms, all lights off, and I shouted for my girlfriend, "Come on!" I eventually got hold of her flashes and bangs everywhere, even on the road that I'd driven on. And I got her in the car <clears throat> and I, I got her back to the other hotel. But at, at that point, we decided 
that we must be armed. So all of us casino guys were armed. Um, I had Don Golden, the hotel manager's hunting rifle. It was a nine millimeter Mauser, beautiful thing. And um, I had bandoliers of ammo. I had my dicky bow tie on. I looked like James Bond. Anyway, I got in the Land Rover and scooted back to, to that building, put her in the basement. Fred and the hotel management in the meantime had put a fridge in there. Everyone was pissed and singing old long Zion and long way to Tipperary. And we had a, uh, about four guys guarding the entrance. And I decided to go in the lift up to the fourth floor of that wing. And I got in the lift and it, there was bangs and explosions outside. But inside the lift, it was quieter and the pipe music was still playing. So it was dun, 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 bang, dun, 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 boom, dun, dun, dun. Anyway, the, the lift opened and I went up to the fired for, forward control officers of artillery and armor of mortars there and uh, just watched them giving commands. And the artillery was up, up at Sprayview Airport, old 25 pounders. We did have some 5.5s from South Africa, um, but these rounds come at such a lovely sound, like in the movies, yeah? Shh. And all these red flashes on the other side, and uh, that that put pay to them. But that once again, a tot of whiskey, and everybody was plastered by the end of that night. My national service was over, <clears throat> but the army hadn't forgotten about me. Um, so, yeah, <clears throat> I had to do some call-ups with the, my, my ear had been deemed healed. I was put into A Company 2RR as a full loot, and I was sent down to the Russian front in Mozambique. Our operating area was from the border to the power lines that ran from Kabora Basset to South Africa. Uh, we could go 10 k's past that and no further because we were territorials and special forces were deeper in. Even if you gave me a million bucks today, I wouldn't go back there. I've never seen such thick bush. I've never seen such uh, corrugated land. I've never seen so many mosquitoes. They literally clouded out the moon at night. And the elephant had created tunnels through the undergrowth. And um, I lost my sergeant there. He was uh, Rob Hickey walking down one of those tunnels. And he met an elephant that had lost its trunk in the minefield. And it killed him, squashed him to death. Uh, it horrible place. I'll never go back there again. Um, and then when I got back to Bulawayo, uh, I was full of tick bites and I, I was so miserable. I just wanted to get out of infantry. I wasn't a cowardly person, but I didn't like this endless walking. I, pre I would love to have been in special forces, but I was not fit enough for it, where I could go and kill somebody at a ta in a task and it's done. This endless walking. So I put in a transfer, which I didn't know if I'd ever get it. But I met my girlfriend at, in Bulawayo and we had the Bulawayo trade fair where our casino went to make money. And we worked long hours and we stayed at the, the hotel there, the, the Gray's Inn or something. It was a lovely experience, but playing all night. And if you were a good creepier, you never got a break. I never got a break because I used to rake in money from everyone. And um, I knew how to spin that ball to avoid the places where they had put the bets. And so we'd go to bed at 10 in the morning and back at work at 8 at night. We made a lot in tips. We went back to Vic Falls and Don Gold and the manager, of the, the owner of the hotel, said, guys, I, I can't pay your tips. I'm hell of a sorry. The hotel's on its bones, and I've got to keep the tips to pay the wages this week, and blah, blah, blah. He was killed six months later in the first Viscount that got shot down, Don Golden. He was one of the... So we we were fed up with this. We depended very heavily on our tips, and we resigned, uh, Marilyn and I. And we went to a little town in the middle of uh, Rhodesia called Kwekwe, my girlfriend got a job in the, the hotel there as a barmaid at the Quickway Hotel. I got a job 
um, at the fertilizer factory. I'll just give you a very quick story about that fertilizer factory. Um, my job was in the air separation plant where, you know, fertilizer is just made from water and air. It's, it's amazing. Uh, I was in the air separation plant. My plant pumped nitrogen over to a plant called the Loop. And the Loop got hydrogen from the biggest electrolysis plant in the world. 25% of Kariba's power went into that electrolysis plant. And it split water into hydrogen and oxygen. So the hydrogen went from there to the loop. My nitrogen went to the loop. And under 350 atmospheres, it was squashed into ammonia. It was then bubbled through nitric acid, and it became ammonium nitrate, which is a beautiful explosive. Now, that was in liquid form, and it was pumped into two 1,000-ton spheres. So depending on the need of fertilizer, there was either 300 tons of liquid ammonium nitrate or 2,000 tons. A wonderful target for the tours. So the government put a massive fence miles away to keep it safe from RPG-7s. I'll never forget that place, the shift work. I had these big salsa compressors at two stories high that I had to open and close to keep everything going. And I was exempt from call up because it was a very intensive training to run that plant. And they didn't want guys getting called up all the time. So I was now out of being called up. Um, moving forward, I'm not too far from the end of my talk. Um, <clears throat> I, I had a very ugly breakup with my girlfriend there. And I went back to Salisbury where my parents were. Jess, my American girlfriend, was still in town. I wondered why we broke up in the first place. And now I was, as I said, the Department of Manpower was very efficient. And I'd no sooner got back to Salisbury and my call-up papers arrived. And I, my heart just sank. I thought, dear God, I can't go back into the infantry. I'll shoot my foot. I just, like I said, it's, it's not that I was scared because I just the slog of walking through the bush being a target all the time. Couldn't handle it. Give me any other unit. I couldn't believe it when I read through the rest of the call-up paper that I'd been transferred to support company in a, a company, 2RR support company. And I was attached to a mortar platoon with 106 millimeter anti-tanks. And I went, yay! I was dancing in circles. And guess where I was based? I was to, to go back to Victoria Falls. I couldn't believe it bikinis and bums and parties, and I couldn't believe it. Anyway, I met my platoon up there, very professional-looking group. I had two sergeants under me, uh, both extremely um, knowledgeable in mortars and anti-tank guns. Rick, of course, he probably more in the anti-tank guns. Joch, the South African guy, he was very good on mortars, had some of the highest qualifications in the Army. And anyway, we got ensconced up there. Now I knew nothing about mortars. <clears throat> All I knew is that the bad bit came out the end of the tube. And uh, so for six weeks, I was trained day and night how to use a plotting board, how to do this, how to do that. And I actually became very proficient. I had the opportunity to take the 106 West into the parks to zero it, put a drum up a thousand meters away. And I had the the blessing to be able to fire it. You sit at right angles to it, you pull a button and it fires a 12.7 marking round. The Arabs used to jump out of their tanks when these Israelis fired that marking round because they knew that the, Arab, the Jewish guys wouldn't miss the Israelis. So then you push the lever and there's a huge flash out of your right and a flash off to the left with a big punch in your kidneys. And then... I missed the drum, <laughs> but if it had been a tank, it, it would have been taken out. I went down to have a look at the strike mark, and there was a hole a meter wide with this teardrop going off, which is what would whiz around the inside of a tank. And I picked that up. I had it as a souvenir for years. It was still red hot. Anyway, <clears throat> we, we were there, and um, life went on as normal. Um, one day we were given, I was called up by radio from 
the sub jock down below at Azumbezi Hotel. Now, a jock is a place, the main jock was at Wanky, and that's where battalion commanders would meet and plan various operations. Then you would have sub jocks feeding off that. Vic Falls was a sub jock for op splinter, op tangent. And at that level, it would be majors, captains, and lieutenants like myself. You would sit around a table, you would have a rep from the army, the air force, artillery. You'd all sit around there and make sure that you're not doing anything to harm each other and to plan operations, joint operations. So I was, I was summoned to go down there at 10 o'clock one morning. I went down there. The first, the hotel was no longer in use. There weren't enough tourists. It was closed down. And we went into the round bar where this, well, a building adjacent to the round bar where this big round mahogany table was with various labels of your unit. Over to the left through a French door was, was a tent with all the radios and you could see guys there talking on radios, buzzing away. And there was an armed guard at the door and I thought, man, there's never been an armed guard at jock meetings before. And anyway, I went in, I took my place. I took Joch with me because I was new to mortars and I might have been asked a technical question I had no answer to. So he sat, all the sergeants sat behind us one row back in a circle. <clears throat> and um, this, the brigadier from one brigade, one brigade covered the whole of our tangent, uh, the, the, the western side of, of Rhodesia. And um, he said, what you guys are about to hear is top, top secret. It must not leave this room. You will be court-martialed if I hear that you've spoken about it. He said the, the enemy for some time has been converting to classical war footing which is where you go from its insurgency to tanks and planes and bombs. And he said, we have it from uplifts in Zambia, whether they were from SAS or Salih Scouts or whatever, that 20,000 Zipra are going to be crossing into Rhodesia. 10,000 will cross at Chirundu, which is east of Kariba. It's a big bridge that goes over there. And the others will be coming across the bridge at Vic Falls. They weren't going to come across on bridging equipment because our Air Force would have taken it out. So they had to cross on bridges. The SAS set about blowing up smaller bridges and lines of communication for the Chirundu one and hitting the RLI and them hit their camps very heavily. But on our side, he said, what they're going to do is that they are going to put 1,200 of their best men onto a train and they're going to put it up to maximum speed on the other side, the Zambian side, come across the bridge and disgorge their guys in Vic Falls and take it out. And so we were, I was quite shocked by this because I had my girlfriend there. My neighbor had his wife and kids there. I thought of all the civilians. I think the white population was about 500 people, maybe two and a half to 3,000 African people. And I just thought, no, this is not cricket. I, I was tempted to tell my girlfriend to get out of town. But then he went on to say what we were going to do to defend the village. And um, uh, basically, we, we had a lot of armored cars moved up there, probably 20 or more. Uh, a third of our entire contingent in the Rhodesian army, we had artillery moved up. Well, they were there already. Uh, we had my mortar team, my anti-tank team, um, a company of nine RR guys were moved up, four in-depth was already there. So we had roughly a battalion of men in, in defense of the village. And so at, at, the, at the place of contact where they were going to come into Rhodesia, where the, the bridge touched the, um, the, the Rhodesian side, hold on, I've got to take a bit of water Sorry, I'm hyperglycemic. My blood sugar drops. Um, what we had done is set up a camera from the old, the little customs building, a remote control camera. A guy was watching through that 24-7. There was already a, a fence on the northern side because the falls run east to west there. And the northern side of the railway line and the road line, there was already a fence there to stop 
people jumping off trains and running in illegally into Rhodesia. On the southern side, there was no fence. So the engineers came along and put up a multi-coiled barbed wire fence and they they put um, plowshares and trip wires and filled it full of all sorts of nasty stuff. Um, and then on the southern side of that, a really big bunker was built to, to uh, accommodate 20 to 30 men. Lots of machine guns, lots of ammo. That little B-10 anti-tank gun that I uh, caused to be captured at uh, Hippo Creek was there ensconced. And then I had my anti-tank weapons behind 44 uh, gallon drums packed with sand, double row. Not much would have got through that, certainly not a T-45 or T-55 tank round. And then there were the same sort of re revetments for armored cars to come into. So, you know, it. and then the railways had put a gadget on the line that would have derailed the train, so it couldn't have gone in too far anyway. So it was, it was well defended. We then had a lot of ambush points put up the river to the minefield. When... When Elephant Hills was burnt down, they thought this is enough is enough. We tired of being a virgin lying in the bush here waiting to get raped. They put a massive minefield all the way around the village out of mortar range. Uh, and 81 can fire 6,000 meters. So they had it 6,500 meters into the bush, this massive uh, barbed wire fence with plowshares. And it was hard to get used to that fence because all night the bangs going off from the baboons and a lot of tension in the air. You know, the, the tourist aircraft used to fly, uh, fly over and get shot at by 12.7s and SAM missiles. And, you know, we were just longing to have a go at these bastards. But anyway, tension was mounting. We didn't know when this crossing was going to happen. Now, a <laughs> little bit of self-patting on my back here. Because I was reasonably easy on the eye as a young man, it didn't take long for me to meet a girl there. And um, to my shame and horror, I was actually in bed when the war started with a girl. And so was my course officer from the School of Infantry. He was in the room above me. Um, he was the head of Grey Scouts. Uh, the whole unit was there as well. And the war started and the firing went off, the bangs. Now, I'm a... I'm a, I, I'm a Quick dresser, I'd undress quicker because of the, you know, the, the uh, urgency to do so. But I dressed very quickly and raced up to my unit on top of the hill. We were ensconced behind Elephant Hills that had been burnt down. That's where our, our mortars had been positioned. Below us, past the Azambezi, right at the, at the junction of the river and the minefield was an ambush point where armored cars were. There were other ambush points down the river. Well, they they weren't really set up. They happened spontaneously when this crossing happened. Now, what we didn't know, we didn't know from that briefing that they were going to send tours across the river in huge dinghies to land inside the minefield and then walk or run or sprint down to the bridge that we were defending and attack us from behind. So this was a, a, to go in through the rear door, so to speak. By the time I got back to the top of the hill, the action was in full swing. It was a moonlit night. The river down below me from, from my Ford observation point, which was just off the Elephant Hills ruins, just to the side of it, I had a lovely position I had my radio. I could talk to Joch and give him fire control orders from there. Right in front of me, uh, this moonlit night, silver river, dark bush on the right, Zambia, dark bush on the left, uh, Rhodesia. I could see all these boats coming across. One was big, probably accommodate 20 men. And it, it was coming across. And I was trying to call the Jock to get permission to open fire. And to this day, I have the utmost frustration that I couldn't let my mortars join in because I couldn't get permission to fire. 
we had to get permission because we didn't know. I had just arranged to hit the launch pad. Okay, it was 5.8 k's away. I could have got it. And I couldn't fire because what happens if there'd been special forces in there giving information back to artillery or whatever? I couldn't do it. So I sat there shouting at the radio. All the while I was watching these boats crossing. And um, Joch was saying, oh, we're going to open fire. What's going on? I said, you can't. You can't get permission. Nobody was answering the radio, and um, which was terrible. And then um, firing started from our side. I've learned through going back into this thing very carefully and speaking to the guys involved that there were a couple of armored cars, uh, an eland and a ferret, parked right there at at uh, Hippo Creek, that very creek I'd landed in with the big tree, and it was now in the middle of the minefield, okay, that creek, or more or less in the middle. The eastern side of it, the side inside the, the village compound, so to speak, at that junction with the river was a sand berm that ate... Um, uh, Grey Scouts guys, the mounted infantry guys, they were there supporting infantry for the two armoured cars. They were now engaging the boats and there was a massive amount of red tracer going into the boats. They were slowly starting to dissolve. Uh, the Elan, one guy said the Elan fired, the guy that was there said he never fired it. But slowly but surely this Clumpier of boats started to dissipate, some going downstream, some getting involved in a swirling action and dragging them into, because um, the currents were quite bad there, dragging them into Hippo Creek. And those poor buggers were shot to pieces. The 28 bodies were found the next day in Hippo Creek. Um, about 10 survivors ran through the minefield and the mines took them out, the plowshares. The ones that got through that uh, were picked up, I think Grey Scouts uh, on their horses picked up another, had a contact with another 10 or so. But some of the boats were starting to go downriver and the Grey Scouts uh, that were in their main camp just to the east of the Azambezi Hotel, they could see on the river these boats coming towards them. So they lined the bank. I believe another armored car did, but this is a 50-year-old memory, and I've had a lot of conflicting reports from many people. But the the gist of it is that these boats were drifting downstream and they were getting hammered by the guys lying on the bank. And um, it went on and on and on, and uh, there were big flashes and bangs in Zambia. Once again, artillery, you could hear the shells, all the big bangs in Zambia, and I could have hit their launching pad, but I didn't have permission. Anyway, it got a bit nasty for the armored car guys because the island to the east of Kandahar is a spit of land coming down in a very narrow V like this, and on it was a, a 12.7 or a 14.5 firing white tracer, and their direction was very accurate towards the armored cars, but a little bit high. Most tours didn't fire at the right elevation. It's always high. And anyway, it scared the armored car commander enough to make the ferret move its position. And um, so that was coming across, that was coming across. Eventually, somebody moved the artillery onto that weapon and it stopped firing. Um, there have been reports that another mortar team opened up, but I've investigated this deeply. I don't think anybody else fired that night was just artillery and armored cars. Okay, so the battle died out, the smoke drifted away. Uh, you couldn't hear a cricket chirp at that point. The next morning when I, I woke up, my I was tossed by the jock to take a couple of vehicles and go through the minefield with some of our smaller tubes, the 60 mils and a couple of boxes of ammo to give fire support to the guys doing follow-ups down below. If any of them got into trouble, we would have been the fire support mission. And it, it was we went through the minefield and up the hill, up the gradient, and found a flat spot. So we weren't 
firing from behind like you would normally do. You don't normally fire line of sight with mortars, but we had to. And so um, we were there, and I heard this rustling in the grass off to the left of me, and it was a very impressive sight. Uh, about 12 Grey Scouts, all blackened up and dressed up, came out of the bush on their horses. You just heard the odd, and then these guys came out. They just seemed to appear out of the bush, and they saw us sitting there with our mortars, and we looked up at them. We didn't exchange a single word, and at a slight command, they, the lead horse turned right and the others followed off. I think they were the guys that hit the 10 tears that had got through the minefield. So that that ended. And then the the major said to me, uh, no, I said, I, I want to go down to the jetty where the boats were now going out to look for survivors. So I went down there and about... Uh, 20 minutes to half an hour later, one of the tourist boats that was laden down with troops and guns uh, went, uh, came back to the, the, the tourist launching pad. And uh, uh, about 20 tourists dressed in brown overalls with black boots. So they were regulars. And one of our talks on fighting men in Rhodesia was by Clive Midlane. And he will tell you that from that month onwards, they were crossing in batches of 100, and they were wearing uniforms. They had radios. They would do proper assaults when you got into a contact. They were regulars, and they would go southwest into Botswana. Um, so these guys came off. Quite a few of them were leaking, some worse than others. And um, I went down to the police station, and I saw all the bodies laid out there, a lot of them. And... Um, the estimated death from that incident, the guy that trained me at the School of Infantry, I can't really rely on his information, but he said a good couple of hundred were killed that night. And my figure is 150, but possibly 200, could have even been higher. I've been trying to get hold of um, Zipro guys that I know to, to give me an answer, but I've never got it out of them. Um, anyway, that 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 was the end of that. There was nothing actually happened at the bridge. If they had tried to cross, we also had our mortars and artillery that would have engaged them. And um, I think some sandbags had been put up at the viewpoints in the hotel behind us with the machine gun up there, uh, plus another 15 or so armored cars waiting to engage them. It would have been a tough nut for them to crack. But that ended that scene. And um, it was strange being back at Vic Falls. I actually went back to the the cottage where my girlfriend and I were and had a bit of a cry over it. Then I left that um, I left that uh, call up. I went back to Salisbury, and um, I'd met my first wife at that very hotel where we had the briefing, and I went back there to the hotel and um, sorry, I met at that hotel. I went back to Salisbury and once again, my mom met a girlfriend that my mom destroyed <laughs> and uh, she didn't like any of the girls I brought there. I didn't know what to do with myself. So I'm about to finish my story now, but I didn't know what to do. So I saw an advert in the, in the paper for the police were looking for instructors with military experience to train and do refresher courses for the police anti-terrorist unit. So I thought, well, why not? I can do that. And so I went in, I had a proper interview. I always thought I was a regular, but one guy said, no, your name was not on the nominal role. I was like um, an adjunct to regulars, whatever you call them. And um, so I went in and did that. And I used to take guys out, we would do jungle lane and retraining and I made them as realistic as possible with real explosives and real bullets and toughened the guys up a bit. Um, and that was very enjoyable. I worked Monday to Friday and I even retrained my brother on one course. And then I did one full course of raw recruits and I actually took my notes from the School of Infantry and I designed 
and a bridge course for them. There was no parade bashing. It, it was all coin tactics. And we, I did that course for them over six weeks. And it turned out very well, in my opinion. Now, while I was with them, two interesting, interesting things happened. And this will be the end of my talk. Uh, one day, my, my uh, superintendent said, we're looking for guys, because it was now April the 17th or something, uh, Zimbabwe was about to be launched, the, in, the elections had come, which was the most dejecting thing you can imagine. Um, I was in the police with a rapid reaction unit the night the election results came through. And some of the guys were so angry, they just threw their rifles out the windows and went home in their motor cars. Um, it, it, it was the most horrible feeling, of course, I'll tell you, that we had lost and this bastard was in power. But anyway, um, I was a, a, asked to become a liaison officer between the Rhodesian government and the police and Indira Gandhi. So... I was sent on a very intensive nine millimeter weapons course to learn how to handle it properly. I was given a, an under armpit shoulder with a, a nine mil star, not the best weapon around, but anyway. And uh, I was put in charge of about eight guys. And uh, I, my first job was to meet her at the airport. She came down the steps with all her Indian garments flowing in the air. I met her security, head of security, introduced myself as liaison officer. Right there was uh, Robert Mugabe and Carrington. And I could have taken that gun out and ended our next 30 years of pain right there and then, because I was here from my television away from Mugabe on many occasions. I mixed with them at the at the Meikles Hotel, and you could smell the corruption and decay on them. I hated every one of them. And I'll never forget the Brit forgive the British for what they did. Not the average British person, but the government. Even though my dad was English, they are disgusting people up top. Even today, the lily-livered people that run our government here in England. Anyway, and I don't mean to offend any English people because I have many good friends, but... Um, I in, intermixed with them and then it was April the 18th and it was Independence Evening I was put in a Peugeot 404 uh, with another one in front of her car which was a Mercedes Benz the Mercedes Benz was hired from a friend of mine Roger Homan and in, in, in order to put a, a flag on, on the wing they hammered a hole through his Mercedes Benz wing like that, bang, bang, and put the standard in there. <laughs> so fixing that hole was probably probably cost him more than the three thousand US dollars he was paid to loan the motor car. Anyway, it was Rafara Stadium. It was midnight on April the eighteenth, nineteen eighty, and uh, the Rafara Stadium can seat about thirty to forty thousand people. They had had Jimi Hendrix or some other guy playing, uh, no, it wasn't Hendrix, and people were trying to get in, and the right police were there clubbing people, and anyway, we got her in, and then, if you ever see the movies of that evening, I'll try and give you one, um, there was a dais there, dais, dais, I was sitting just to the right of that, as you look at that dais from the center of the playing field in the stadium, I'm not quite in screen, but I sat there at Mrs. Gandhi's back. Up on the, the dais was the, the governor. There was the head of um, the judiciary. There was Prince Charles. There was Nkoma. There was Mugabe. And uh, Indira Gandhi, Carrington. There was about 20 of these sleazeballs up there. The one thing that put Prince Charles up in my elevation greatly is that he refused to shake the hand of Joshua Nkoma. He put his hand behind his back. The reason why he did that is because Josh and Como laughed on radio when the Vikings were shot down and said it was the best thing he ever did. So I take my hat off to him. I don't particularly like the current royal family, but he did a good deed then. So it's getting closer to midnight. Troops marched into the auditorium 
and um, in came first was the RAR, the Rhodesian African Rifles. Their boots were shining. They had their mascot. I think it was a goat. They, they, you know, the Africans can march, eh? and they came in with their uh, things with the thing there, their caps, and they came to a halt perfectly. They were booed, heckled, Coca-Cola bottles thrown at them. Then came in uh, Zipra, the Matabili guys who the Mashona didn't like. So they got a few boos. And they were reasonably well organized and disciplined. And then came in the Zandler, Mugabe's lot. They looked like a drunk millipede slopping their way into the audience. And they were cheered. And, and, and um, then comes midnight. I don't know why, but the Air Force did a flyover. I mean, you can't see an Air Force at night. And I really laughed my totsy off because guys were bailing off the, the metal seats over there and ducking under the stands when the plane flew over. And they were obviously ex that had, had been bombed a few times. So I had a chuckle over that. But the thing that saddened me, and it's in my book that if anybody wants to buy, um, the, it's in the foreword, um, A Walk Against the Stream. Um, that The saddest thing for me was that um, it was the Rhodesian flag didn't appear up there. It was the British flag that was lowered. I apologize if my memory is wrong on this. It's 50, nearly 50 years ago, but I'm pretty darn sure it was the, it's not the Union Jack. The Jack is only flown on naval vessels. It was the Union flag came down and the Zimbabwe flag went up. And of course, uh, a joke went around. Yeah, look, it's, it's the white bits on the flag that's holding it together. But I don't want to come across as too racist. I have I have many black friends. But um, that was the end of that incident. And um, the last one I want to tell you about is the next day I was going to meet my first wife uh, in Manika Road. She worked for Founders Building Society, a, 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 a bank, whatever you call it. I was just entering the front entrance when I heard this ruckus on the other side of the road. And there must have been 20 or 30 people chasing this poor sod down the road, uh, the pavement on the other side, beating the living daylights out of him. And I was in uniform. I have a peak cap on and I was in my combat uniform, you know, uh, camo. Uh, ran across, I said to Diane, my wife, I said, call the police, tell them to, to bring reinforcements urgently. I ran across the road unarmed and I confronted this crowd and I've actually got a video clip of it. It was filmed by UT, UPN or UTN news people. And I stepped forward in a very authoritative voice and I told them to leave the guy alone in no uncertain terms. Uh, there's an African woman in the background who backed away so quickly she almost fell over in the door entrance of a building. <laughs> And and I just thought, you know, we the uniform and the, they respect authority, and um, they backed off, and I, I made sure that he got away that guy. But I was so angry, I turned to the cameraman who had been filming this, and I said. Is this what independence, this is what independence means in Africa. The biggest fist going to win. And you bloody British, because I knew it was a British camera true, are, are the cause of this. Um, once again, I apologize if I'm offending anybody, but that's how I felt at the time. You know, we had many good British soldiers in our army. So I'm not having a go at the Poms, but at their leaders. They were corrupt, nasty critters. And... Um, uh, 
things went bad with, and I left there in 1981 and moved to South Africa. And I eventually went back to Zimbabwe, as it was then, started up a very successful construction company. I employed 450 people. Uh, but when Mugabe started taking the farms away, it was horrific. Construction companies are the first to collapse when an economy goes bad. And then I, I had to move to England after 20 years of running my own business and start all over again. I slept in a shed with no water, no toilet, uh, looking for work to reestablish my life. And um, that's my story, as pitiful as it is, of course. Man, that's a fantastic story. I I must tell you, I was sitting here uh, listening, listening, and thinking to myself, there's a lot of education to be done to the South Africans listening here, yeah, because many of them will not remember the Vicons being shot down. Mm. So if you people can talk about that on Legacy, I would be most grateful. Mm. And we're also going to put links of your book or books in below in the description, guys. Please get hold of it, I have. Friends, one is sitting in Canada, I'm not allowed to mention his name, uh, but he actually read it and he said to me, Chris, <laughs> you better read that, my man. And, and you know, there's something interesting here because 77, 78, I was in Katima Mulilo, which was just not too uh -huh. far away from the big Yes, yes. Because my dad, I'm not sure what he was doing there. I think he might have been a magistrate or something, but I was about 10 years old. Mm -hmm. But there were lots of mortar stompings and attacks and things on Katima <laughs> long before that incident happened. So yes. when you were talking there of these ambients getting too big for their shoes and shooting me over the border, I was thinking back, you know what, they they bloody well owe me or I owe them because I built a, my mom at these rock gardens, I don't know what you call it in English, Rothstein, rock garden. Yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, we built a pool. I had to make the dug out the cement myself. And uh, I built this pool for her, and I was very, very proud of it. And then the motor round went right into it. Wow. And uh, that blew that to hell. Okay. And I was not impressed with the terms at that stage. I mean, they screwed up my work. Um, <laughs> and then I just want to mention in the SAP coin units, we did have a song about Kaunda. It was. Oh, yeah. you know, those people we don't know, it was the life president of uh, Zambia. Yeah. And it meant something, and I'm not going to sing it, because, man, I sound like I, you know, I need. I know this <laughs> from quite a few people. But it's something like, and I have to say it in Afrikaans, Kaka, we know you're more some more. Yeah. It went on like that for about 10, 10 uh, different, different yeah. rhymes. And, and, yeah. and another thing I want to mention is, you know, one of the big ifs of the South African war, and I'm still trying to get people to talk about it, is when the Cuban division of about, I think, a 50th division or something, there were about 50,000 people of them. I might be wrong with the names. Forgive me, guys, you be experts. Mm. Uh, but they were threatening to come down south and cross the Namibian border. Absolutely. And uh, the South Africans then... I think we called up 400,000 men. So they wow. sent the papers out and they also said, we've got atomic weapons. Wow. Come across that border and see what happens. We will, we will, we will nuke you. And oh, of course, definitely. they never did and they never came through. And the other three quits the South Africans pulled. And I think the Rhodesians did the same 10 years before. This is so fascinating. Is they started spreading the rumor that they had regiments of G5. You know, uh, how it's just around and all sorts of really conventional stuff. And I know the Indians yeah. were playing tricks with a few tanks, which yes. I think South Africans stole for them from a ship, which is another story. It was a T-56 or what was it? It was something T like that. Yeah, we, we got eight or ten T-55s from a shipment that was from uh, Libya. It was supposed, right. to go, supposed to go to Uganda. Yes. And it only got as far as Durban Port. And... Uh, we stole the tanks, or somebody did, and ended up. So we had a contingent of T-55 tanks and um, T-34s. We had 23 tanks in our infantry. Not exactly the 4th Armored Division, but, you know, uh, put in the right place. Put, put in, in the, the right place. place. I mean, one of them are actually standing in Johannesburg at that uh, museum mm -hmm. where they in, in Johannesburg. Oh. One of them oh, is still yes. standing there. Yes. But the South African Navy intercepted that ship and they brought them back and we used a few to 
to test them, to shoot them, and the rest we gave to Rhodesians. Well, I believe when you went around to these tanks as if you had to hold them on the division, uh, it played some tricks beyond the guys. I also yeah. know, I just want to say this in case people don't know it, and if I'm wrong, please correct me, but yeah. the Special Air Service was actually recreated by the Rhodesians in the Malayan, in the Malayan uh, campaign. Is that true? Yeah, there was A, B, and C squadron. Uh, the two A and B were English. C squadron was the Rhodesian squadron. And so it wasn't reconstituted in as much as that it was existing and it fought in the Malaysian campaign. Yeah, very successfully as well. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think we did learn a bit from, from the, the POMs that were fighting in Malaya, but we also developed our own counterinsurgency tactics. And the, the, the black RAR troops were, were exceptionally good there as well. Um, so, yeah. Very good troops. Um, because of our manpower shortages, even national servicemen were being recruited into the SAs towards the end of the war, but they had to go through a very, very, very tough selection course. And then were trained up mainly to be used in call-ups at the end of their um, their national service. But they did their best to maintain the standards. Yeah. Am I, it, uh, am I correct if I say to you uh, and I just want to get the history correct. Yeah, once again, there might be people who don't know, and I stand to be corrected. But when the Lancaster House Agreements came, that is where Rhodesia was betrayed for you people who don't know. There is yeah. an asshole there called Lord Carrington. We yes. do refer to as Carrington. He's an, but we not go into that guys. Basically, yeah. we betrayed Rhodesia. And then Rhodesia stopped being independent. The UDI was declared not to to exist anymore, it became a British colony again. Suddenly you had the British Bobby standing around there looking stupid. And you had the British army ar arriving without any land landmine proof vehicles. Yeah. I felt they had to borrow your your old land rovers, carries and things there. Yeah. And uh, then there's a very famous photograph of a whole line of Rhodesian lads showing the uh posterior. Yes, I was trying to yeah. put those nice the, now. This, the, the, Scot the, the Scottish what, what? the Scottish salute, um, you know, like from Braveheart. Uh, basically, it was in the southeast, and um, I think some monitoring force guys were, were landing in a C-130, and so everyone pulled their pants down, turned around, and gave them a brown eye, which was the best salute we could give the Poms. <laughs> no, that's a wonderful <laughs> one, but, you know, I was always thinking that they might be Maybe I might have gotten a bit excited, you know, so it's a good thing. That <laughs> <laughs> well, the, eff the, eff the effeminate soldiers you have today might have been very excited by that welcome, but you did not back then. It was a great insult. But, you know, the, the British army was actually put together to come and attack Rhodesia. They were going to put, put together six brigades of infantry, and they were actually going to invade. I don't know if you know that. The, the plans were well advanced. They were approved by, by the top brass. But you know what happened? Um, the men, the lower ranks, the, the, the majors and so on, they refused to do it. They refused to come and fight in Rhodesia. So it's that lower echelon um, of the British people I don't have any problems with. It's the the elite, the ones who think they know everything. I can't stand them. And um, they never came to fight. And they said it would have taken six to eight brigades of infantry to defeat us. I think if we had totally mobilized our men, we would have squashed eight brigades. But then they would have had an air force that would have made a huge difference to their side of it. But they never fought. They stopped. We also had French um, legionnaires fighting in the war. We had two companies of French legionnaires fighting. And a lot of uh, guys came over voluntarily from the end of the Vietnamese war. In fact, one of my captains was um, a, a Yank. Um, and a lot of the guys who fought in the columns going into Mozambique, there was a famous one, I forget his name now, who they said, go go down the road and kill a few twos. He almost got to Mapai. I mean, to um, uh, Lorenzo Marx. Um, 
but yeah, we had a, a vast diversity of, of people fighting. I even had a Russian in my base camp at one point. You know, this is this is fascinating to me because I didn't know about that planned British attack. Um I would, I think we would have seen the assets. They they were not they were not really equipped to take on a, a place like Rhodesia. And yeah. one of the generals actually said here in about nineteen seventy nine that uh, for what they were doing, the Rhodesian army was simply the best in the world. And and he meant every damn word he said. Perhaps it was a warning to them to Stop thinking like idiots. Yes, a, a, a major general or a lieutenant general did say that, that the Rhodesian army, in terms of counterinsurgency, uh, was very good. You know, um, I've, I've always tempered that comment with the fact that we, we weren't fighting um, people who could shoot straight. I know towards the end of the war, um, the ability and their training got really good and really aggressive and really and and you only have to look at Mapai, the Battle of Mapai. Um we met our match there and that's up against SAS troops and RLI. So I think we were a very well trained army. We we had exceptionally good officers generally, good at planning. The Orders were clear and precise. Um, there was a contingency for everything. I never went a day without ammunition or food, so the logistics were very good. Um, just basically a very efficient little army that could convert from a coin out on patrol in the bush to a conventional unit within a few hours. And um, I think from that point of view, that, that yeah, I think we had a very good little army. This attack on Mapai is that the Puma 164 wing now? That's right, yes, yes, yeah, the 164. That's right, yeah. Yeah, that that's was... a very sad thing. I have to ask you something sad as well, you tell at the end. And I don't know if you know the answer, but in the SAP where I come from, in a counter insurgency units were involved in Rhodesia long before the National Servicemen in South Africa got to our own war. So we considered ourselves to be much more experienced. Of course, our special forces were there as well as, including all our chopper pilots and other pilots, uh, all wearing the decent police camo. Uh, but the fact is, we learned the tricks of a trade in Rhodesia, and we're very grateful. Mm. But then we lost the patrol. There was a sergeant and I think three or four constables, and they, I think there was a truce going on, and they, they left their rifles, they went for a swim, I believe yes. uh, terrorists appear. That's uh, right. They killed, they killed the constables. The sergeant is still missing. We don't know. Yeah. He must be dead. Then, so it, in, they, 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 in, in, this, in the SAP, rumors started that it was a Salih Scout operation. No. That was true? just just west of Vic Falls. They were swimming in a pool of water uh, about once again near Hippo Creek. And they just left their rifles propped up against a tree and went for a swim. As far as I know, they were shot with their own weapons. I, I don't know if that's true. But yeah, I think all of them died and one got away. As you say, or was captured, never never seen again. But absolutely no, there would be no reason for the Salute Scouts to do that. I'll, I'll tell you something, by and large, and I'm speaking from all of the guys I know, we have the utmost respect for the South Africans. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't do anything that jeopardized our relationship with them. We depended on the fuel and ammo. And uh, we had one train load of ammo come in one day that took two days to unload with like a hundred men. We used to get loads of ammo. And um, no, the relationship at that level was extremely good. And if you watch one of the fighting men of Rhodesia talks, uh, the, um, the guy, was interviewing the, I think it was the Parabats or Five Ricky or somebody that came over and fought down near Bite Bridge. And um, the feedback was from the RAR, RAR guys that they fought with, they couldn't believe how aggressive the South African soldiers were, that they really got stuck in. And they had big Puma aircraft that could drop 15 guys off at a time. 
versus R4 in a, in a Alouette. And um, the, those guys in the RAR, in, in a stick of, uh, or a platoon of 20, they'd have 16 MAGs, 16 machine guns. They didn't want to mess around. But this vertical envelopment out of Pumas with, with 15 men in it was just such a breath of fresh air for the Rhodesian army. And so it's a pity we never, ever really fought together full time. Um, it, it might have had a, a vastly different outcome. Don't know. But we did, I believe, have a full battalion of South African troops in the Rhodesian army dressed in, in our uniforms. So, um, yeah. There was a bit of hand and glove. Yeah, it's true. I think the paratroopers were there. And then yes, also the um, special forces, of course, were there. Yes. Especially there on the Russian front, they became quite... They were quite called uh, D, D Squadron. They were called D, D Squadron. Squadron. That's yeah. right. Yes, but they yes. couldn't speak English that well. I mean, they were not... Um, I don't think anybody was fooled. I mean, did you guys in the, in the, in the army knew? That some of your people might not be who they say they are. I, I I think we could pick them out very quickly, even if they were English speaking South Africans, because the English speaking South Africans have got a slightly different lilt to the way of talking, and they don't know our slang. And so our little radars would pick up very quickly. We would know straight away if it was a Pommy or an Aussie or and and we would treat them with sus sus suspicion to begin with until we could trust them. But there quite a few spies came in that way. I mean, our um, our spy service was compromised very badly by Ken Flower and other people like that. So um, we and a lot of our missions into Zambia turned out to be lemons because these guys were feeding information back in real time. Um, this, particularly the one on the raid on Nkomo's house. He said he escaped through the toilet window, but that would be like trying to put an elephant through a door. <laughs> yeah, that's nonsense. There's no way he could have escaped. He was grossly fat, man. You go in the corner, yeah. that guy couldn't escape through a. Was this like you say? The, it's like a the, funniest, the funniest thing I ever saw, Josh Nkomo, was him eating these big langoustines, you know, the big prawns. He didn't know that you had to break off the head. He was eating all the spines, and I could hear him at the next table saying, hmm, I don't know what they see in these things. You know, <laughs> He didn't realize that it's only the meaty bit you ate. You see, that is, that is actually where your problem started. With Robert McGarvey, I found out it's in one of my books as well. Uh, he actually attended Jesuit schools. Yeah. And that, if you don't understand what I just said to you, go and find out. Oh, that absolutely. is where his, his problems in prodigious problems came. Is from world that. worldwide, in fact. The, worldwide, the wherever you see the Jesuit order, it is. If you link right. it into the, the the Black Pope, and they own America, yeah. I can tell no, you. No, of course they do. They control it. It's yeah. a second beast. I wrote books on that. Yeah, yeah. And people should should take note because whenever you yeah. see problems, you see the Jesuits are. Pulling the yeah. strings on the bank. You know, I always thought that the 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 British being our blood brothers were gonna be on sides and but now as I've come back into 2024 and I've been studying geopolitics for the last 25 years, I realized that it was just all part of a big game, a big elitist game to entrench the select few in power. They couldn't give a toss about their kin. I'm talking at that demonic level at the top, not the average pom at the bottom. They're good people. Um, but, you know, that top top lot. Mm -mm. Even the Queen said there's something very dark and sinister in England, something very dark. She said that. It's on record. And it's all these guys. Don't for one second think that a president or a prime minister runs a country. Not a chance. And voting's a joke. Do you know that Arnold Schwarzenegger was seen getting into a helicopter belonging to the Rothschilds? And three months later, he was the governor of California. It's, 
you know, it's just... No, there's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, people need to study. And you know what's funny about life is all these um, conspiracy theories are turning out true. Mm. On one hand, I, I really enjoy seeing it. On the other hand, I wonder what's going to happen in the future. But that's, mm. a, that's the last question I have for you. Uh, Tony, when you guys came south to South Africa, I remember more than one of those uncles said to me, I give you guys 10 years. 10 years. And I thought, man, do you realize how big is South Africa? How powerful yeah. that country is? Do you realize that? Mm. And they were sad. They were not angry. They were not fighting. Mm. They were just, they were like sad. You know, they were the same mm. guys. I'm telling you, 10 years. Mm. And they were so experienced. I remember one of them, I just joined the police and he was, I don't know what unit. And he said to me, uh, listen, you're my, my boy. And I didn't take any offense because this guy, man, he had like Mr. Experience written all over him. Mm. And he said to me, stop wearing that, 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 that side arm of yours here on your hip, like your re regulations say, put it mm. on a, your armpit like a detector because when you drive, it's easy to. Mm. I thought, yeah, it makes sense. Mm. And 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 I often wondered how the hell did you people know ten years? What did you see in us, which which made you think we're going to surrender that quickly? It wasn't a surrender; it was a forced capitulation by the West and sanctions. And South Africa could have raised six hundred thousand troops. They had rifles for every one of them, a truck for everyone. They could have taken on large um, on an a large army from the Russians or anybody, and still survived. It, it was it it was a gross uh, distortion of of politics and um, this excuse that we had to worry about human rights and freedom for all. Well, it, it's done nothing for the majority. But I, I think I I I felt that South Africa would last thirty years when I went there in nineteen eighty, and my feeling was that South Africa was strong enough to stop everything on the military front but not on the economic front and the political front. It was too isolated. And the, the pressure, it was just pressure upon pressure upon pressure. And they, they wanted majority rule. And now that looking back in hindsight, it was nothing to do with people or the betterment of people's lives. It was to get the resources. And this rotten, festering scab that's over the whole world got into power as part of the scab overseas. Yeah, and the problem is, for those, again, those who don't realize this, South Africa controls the sea route. Yes. Uh, Cape of Good Hope. <clears throat> and let me tell you, that's a massive problem. And we can speak about this for a long time, because I know that the Chinese has built themselves a huge air base at Maringwa. Maringwe. Maring, <clears throat> Maring, some, some word like that there. Uh, and then Rhodesia was, was a bop of themselves as the, one of the biggest satellite interception stations in the world, run mm -hmm. by the Chinese. Let me mm -hmm. tell you guys, there's a lot you don't know in the background, but I want to take really a last thing because we've been speaking more than two and a half hours. I It's so fantastic. Now, there was an attack in the 1990s in Cape Town on a church. Yes. And some Russian uh, sailor got himself injured there. I think he lost his leg. Apollo members came storming in and they, they, they threw hand grenades. I believe it was an extra vision was shot back. He was on. Is That's that right. That's absolutely true. Yes, he was uh, having a meal, had a side arm, and uh, they tried to take on the, the people having a meal, and he took him out. Yeah, that's absolutely real. Yeah. So... Um, but, you know, anybody could have had a weapon and done that at the time. It was just one thing, I think all of us, and even the South African guys that had, had some type of experience, you were always on the alert, always. You, you never stop being on the alert. And even to this day, um, I cannot sit in the middle of a restaurant. I can't. Don't ask me. I have uh, to go to a wall. My back has to be... And I didn't see a lot of action, but I saw enough and experienced enough to know my back's got to be covered. And so that guy was probably thinking it's going to happen in South Africa, which it started to do. And he just kept his handgun on him. And, and thank God he did, because he saved a lot of people's lives. Yeah. Yeah, he did. He did. Well, 
you know, Tony, we've come to the end of this one, but I'm sure we're going to talk again because I'm serious. There is some education to be done, and and, and I'm serious about the Vikings mm. because there might be people who don't understand what happened there. And it is important that you people understand what happens there because it's going to happen again. I'm telling you, from that came certain other things as well. Absolutely. And, uh, we need the to world, talk about that. The world is, is getting more and more evil. It's not getting better. and It's not going to get better, I'm afraid to say. Um, there are things coming that are going to scare the hell out of people in the coming months and years. And, um, yeah, it's that's what it is. <laughs> but well, we just like you we've gone to live in the diaspora we're all over the world now and I'm in England I've never recovered from what happened to me having to come and live here but thank God today the sun's out there's uh, on the road below me is a, a pool of water big enough to put an Olympic swimmer in from the rain but you've got to take the good with the bad you know you just have to I'm, I'm proud to say that I was kicked out of England twice. <laughs> One was for putting on Lord Kitchener's pictures there at uh, the World <laughs> Museum there in London. Um, it was yeah. a real nice gop, I have to say, to you. And if you think of it, was, was gay as well. And yeah. I don't know anything about it against gays, but he's the guy, in case you guys don't know, he's, he has that finger pointing and he says, oh, yeah. I want you. Yeah. And apparently he was a man who would get anything from a sheep to a goat. He, he, he never yeah. actually of course he didn't like Lord Kitchener. We we thoroughly enjoyed it when a South African spy murdered him. I think in 1916 on a ship. Or yeah. they say it was a South African spy. We can talk about that too. Um in, in closing, that. in closing, I've adopted this expression that if you're an American or English or Australian soldier now. You are a bank employee. It's all for the banks. And uh, that's it. We don't count. They don't care about the soldiers. You are a bank employee if you're in a Western army at the moment. And we can talk about Ukraine. It's the biggest um, funneling of money into the the, the military thing in, in America that they've ever had. They're making millions out of it. Yeah, it's, it's money laundering. It's nothing right. In fact, they're serving evil, and I don't blame the average soldier. I feel the same way as you say, you know. It's mm. not the, that's not the guy from the major rank and below. Absolutely. It's the guy up there. They know what yeah. they're doing. They yeah. know what they're doing. And guys, it's evil. What's happening in the world right now Absolutely. is very cool. So yeah. it's, 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 you know what? It's religious as mm. well. It's it is. Good it is. evil. It's a spiritual, it's a spiritual, it's a spiritual battle. thing which came down. I've studied that side of it for 42 years now. I can give you long talks on that. And it's all revolving around Israel. And uh, it's good versus evil. That's all it is. Yeah. yeah. And there's certain things which these evil ones, the, the, um, the cultists, the satanic uh, worshippers, which they predicted. It's right, in their yeah, books. And it's, it's happening coming. now. And, and listen to the year 2025. Yeah. Oh, yeah. about 2025. They this, year, predictions. this year, next year. In yeah. fact, I've written a book called The End Time Simplified, if anybody wants to read it. And the geopolitics and spiritual side are all explained in there. Now, you yeah. see, people, we have uh, hidden talents here. Tony, what you do is give me a list of all your books. And yeah, then okay. you will put them down here, yeah, and please, guys, go and go and see them. And then I also invite you, come and talk to us at Legacy about every one of your books. We have okay. like a book show. It's not as long as this one. It's about 40, yeah. 40 minutes. But we just thought, tell me what's about to be going on. Sure. And we, have that. we haven't reviewed anybody's book for a while. For, for the South African viewers, um, if you can't get my book there, I will leave the ISBN numbers for you to put up and you, they, the book company will order them because normally it's Amazon that sells them. Okay, let us say goodbye before you're okay. in trouble. I am okay. luckier than your wife is in Switzerland for the next four months still, so only me in one <laughs> big lonely hotel. So if you guys <laughs> ever want some company, come here, man. Um, well, I, anyway, I wish you all the very best there, man. Yeah, yeah. thanks, man. We're having fun. As we say at Legacy, guys, let me just say goodbye here. Uh, 
Yeah. Once again, Tony, thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed this. I always Pleasure. invite Norwegians to come back. Yeah. Um, and uh, God bless. Top sins. Thank you, my mate. Bye bye. Cheers. Thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe, and ring the bell to receive notifications.